Hello, everybody. We're going to to begin a new uh, a new session of the doctoral meeting, and in this this time, uh, Rosalind Robuk is going to present uh, her work, her PhD work. Uh, she's working since uh, three years ago. I'm not no, sure. two years. In two Santiago. years. Two. two years here at Hitius. Uh, in the work led by David Growacki and with different people that uh, are attending here. Uh, I hope that uh, you will have some questions to, to exchange, uh, to ask her and some comments uh, to share with her at the end of the presentation. The presentation is basically based on molecular simulations in virtual reality and some experiences related to this virtual reality environment and we will have the opportunity to discuss the work. It's very interesting because it's an interdisciplinary work. Uh, includes uh, concepts by molecular dynamics, uh, pharmacology, psychology, and computer, obviously, uh, computer science. And I think that uh, the, the different extensions of the work are all of them very, very interesting. And I have some questions just right now. So, I hope that you have you will have also questions at the end. So when you want, you you have around twenty minutes for the presentation, okay. and at the end, it might take twenty five if that's okay. not ma not bad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Cool. So hello everyone. I think you all know me, but for people listening, uh, I'm Roz, and I'm part of the Intangible Realities Lab here at Thetius, which is headed by David Glowacki. and as Dora said. Uh, we specialize in molecular simulations in virtual reality. And uh, don't worry if you don't know what that is, I'll explain it as we go. And today I'm going to be talking about alternatives to physical touch when interacting with molecular simulations in VR. So to start with, I'm going to do an introduction to molecular modeling because I know we have a range of backgrounds in this room. People maybe don't know what a molecule is. They uh, to introduce my research aims um, in my thesis. And then I'm going to be talking about two branches of my research. The first one is sensing properties of virtual molecules. And finally, group meditations using molecular simulations in virtual reality. So, introduction to molecular modeling. So, molecular modeling is really, really important for people like chemists, people who are interested in atoms and molecules, because they lie outside of our direct sensory experience. We can't interact with molecules, individual molecules, without some kind of equipment. We can't do it with our naked senses. So to understand them, to understand the shapes that they make and the behavior that they have, we come up with models, ways of visualizing them and representing them to give us research insight. So one of the big uh, steps forward in molecular modeling was the generation of physical models. In about the mid 20th century, people started making full-scale um, molecular models. So here is uh, vitamin B12 by Dorothy Hodgkin, and she won the Nobel Prize for this work. And a bit later on came this double helix strand by Watson and Crick, who also won a Nobel Prize for this work. And now these kind of physical models are everywhere. Most chemists will have used them, and they're really important for understanding the structures that molecules take and the sort of bonding that they make. And here, so here is a quote by Richard Feynman, a very famous quote, you might have heard it before. If we were to name the most powerful assumption of all, which leads one on and on in an attempt to understand life, it is that all things are made of atoms and that everything that living things do can be understood in terms of the jigglings and wigglings of atoms. And I really like this quote because it highlights how important it is for us to understand not just the static average structures that molecules take, but the way that they move through time, the way that they jiggle and wiggle. And so this brings me on to molecular simulations. So molecular simulations are ways of representing the way that atoms and molecules jiggle and wiggle. And there are lots of different techniques and algorithms that have been developed to simulate molecule, molecules. And again, they started in around the mid 20th century. And so all my work is using a model called molecular dynamics, which is essentially um, a model 
that uses classical mechanics to propagate molecular structures through time. And all of the, the rest of my work that I'm going to be talking about is about molecular dynamics. So a typical molecular dynamics workflow goes something like this. You have a molecular structure that's defined in a file. Um, you send it off to a computer to simulate, to run the calculation. And then once that calculation is done, you receive it back and you watch it as a kind of video on a 2D monitor. And this video we call a trajectory. It's essentially a frame by frame set, um, set, of, set of frames with the molecular coordinates. So you can play it as a video and see how that molecule moves through time. And so since these algorithms have been developed, we've had a lot of advancements in technology and computing, and we've added new features. So we can start to add interactivity. We can basically apply forces to those molecular systems um, to sort of steer them in the way that we want them to go. We can also now do 3D visualizations. So although people still do very often look at these 3D molecules on a 2D computer screen, we are able to visualize them in 3D. And finally, we can do on the fly calculations. So instead of running it on a supercomputer, which might take days or weeks, we can wait for the we don't have to wait for the calculation. We can actually do it in real time. And so this brings me on to the work that we do in our lab, which combines all, all of these. And so we've developed a, uh, a, a program for interactive molecular simulations in VR. And this is a screen recording of my colleague Jonathan inside our VR program. And so here he's actually manipulating what we call a polypeptide which is basically like a single strand of DNA. It's a string of amino acids. Um, and he's tying it in a knot. <laughs> um, and so you can really see how different this kind of model, although visibly, visually it's kind of similar to the models that we were using back in the mid 20th century. As you see it move through time, you can see, really see the jiggling and wiggling of the different atoms. And so now we're at a point we can see the molecules, we can interact with them, but we want to feel them too. Um, and this brings us to the question, what should it feel like to touch a molecule? And we don't know, because as I said at the beginning of this talk, atoms and molecules lie outside of our direct sensory experience. We can't touch them, we can't feel them in the physical world. So we don't know what the answer to this question is. And so historically, interactive molecular simulations have actually almost always used physical feedback um, using devices like these. So they're desktop devices that a user holds, interacts with the molecule, and as they're doing that, they receive um, force feedback, some resistance to their movement based on the kind of forces that are happening in that molecular system. But these Devices and this setup is just one interpretation of many different interpretations that you can take to what a molecule should feel like. Um, so are this, the question is, what other ways can a molecule feel like? And before I talk about my research aims, I just want to introduce what we mean by touching. What is physical touch? So physical touch is categorized into two different aspects. On one hand, we have what we call discriminative touch, which is sensing the properties of external stimuli. So, and this is really important for understanding the external world. So when I pick up an object, I can feel its texture, I have a sense of its weight, I have a sense of its size and its shape. Um, and that's all about discriminating the properties of that external stimulus or external object. And on the other hand, we have affective touch. And affective touch is affective kind of Sometimes this is called emotional touch, but emotional kind of narrows it in a little bit more than affective. So the affective component is really important for well-being, social bonding, safety. And so things that would come under this category are things like pain. Pain is a really important safety mechanism that we've developed. So when you pick up a hot object, you have a pain mechanism. You let go of it to, to keep yourself from physical harm. But it's something about your response to physical touch. It's not about the object itself. And other things might be uh, social, for social bonding, interpersonal touch. So having a hug from a, a friend or a family member makes you feel safe. It makes you feel 
um, relaxed. But there's also a context in here. So a hug from someone else might feel differently. And this is all about the affective component of touch. So this brings me on to my research aims. So if we, okay, my research aims. What alternatives to physical touch are available to us when interacting with molecules in VR? And I'm asking this because we don't know what it's like to touch a molecule. So if we take our diagram of physical touch and we add interaction in VR with molecules, and we're saying physical touch is not available to us because we can't physically touch molecules. My two research questions, the two branches of my research are, is there some way that we can sense their properties through discriminative interaction that's not as an alternative to physical touch? And then on the other hand, is there another branch through affective interaction? Can we, is there an affective component to interacting with molecules in VR? And these are the two branches that I'm gonna be talking about uh, now. So I'm gonna start with discriminative interaction because it's slightly more intuitive to get. And this brings me on to sensing properties of virtual molecules. So here is another video of some old colleagues of ours in our VR program. And so we've taken many, many people through our program over the last few years. And we get a lot of comments saying this molecule feels different to that one, which is interesting because they're not receiving any physical feedback. So what is it that they're feeling? Um, and so after getting these comments quite a few times, we decided we wanted to try and measure it. Is this something that we can measure? So we did a pilot study where we took pairs of people, we put them into VR in our VR program, and we gave them sets of molecules that were um, altered in some way so that they had different properties. So for example, here we have the two participants. Here we have someone without VR controllers, and here we have someone with VR controllers. And the person with VR controllers was asked to interact with the three molecules, and the other person was observing in VR. And so here we have one molecule that was hard, one that was in the middle, and one was soft. And we did this for two different types of molecules. And then we measured, did they notice a difference between the physical properties of the three molecules and whether they could rank them in terms of their rigidity? And what we found was that um, interactors, people who were interacting with the molecule, were more likely to notice the difference between the three, the three systems and were more likely to be able to correctly rank the three molecules. And so this is interesting because it's telling us that actually people who observe and interact in VR can tell differences between molecules and people who are interacting seem to have an enhanced perception. So this brings me on to what we're doing right now, which is a follow-up user study. And I'm not gonna talk about the exact study details here, but essentially we want to quantify this perception. So we, can't, we did a pilot study just to see if it was something that we could measure. And now we want to quantify the difference that people can notice, people can sense. And so we're actually currently prototyping this and we'll be recruiting soon. So we'll send an email out to the department and um, please do sign up if you want to come and see if you can touch molecules. And it will be a lot of fun and you can come see our lab and we have other things to show you. So please do sign up for that when, uh, when you get that email. Okay, so why do we want to quantify perception? What's, what's the next step? Well, we want to look at the kind of properties that we can sense in VR. And so far we are just looking at rigidity because it's quite a good starting point. It's uh, intuitive and it's very easy to, um, to change. And so we can start looking at what other properties can we sense. And the things that I'm really excited about is if we can start to quantify the perception, this perception, then we can start looking at the tools that we're using and we can start comparing how different tools affect our perception of molecules. And we don't know because molecules, we can't touch molecules in the physical world. We don't know what the right tools are. So should we be using controllers? Should we be using our hands? Should we be using our bodies? We don't know. But if we can start to quantify that perception, we can start comparing these tools quantitatively. We can also start looking at the models and representations that we're using because model, all the models that we use for molecules are just 
one interpretation of what a molecule could look like. And those interpretations are really useful for us, but there's no correct interpretation. So we can start to look at how these models are affecting our perception of them. And maybe there's some new models that we can use that virtual reality um, allows us to do in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So maybe mod molecules that change with interaction, molecule, uh, models that the, the dynamic and interactive models, rather than kind of taking the same models that we used for static molecular models into VR, maybe that's not the right way to do it. And then finally, we can look at priming. So how do we prepare people to go into VR and touch these simulations? And so the research literature has shown that the way that you prepare people to go into VR has a big impact on how they experience that virtual environment. And they've looked at things like just telling someone that they can sense virtual objects enhances their perception. And also things like meditation can actually enhance perception. And so we can start to quantify how much med things like that, the, the priming, affects people's perception. And so maybe everyone should be doing a meditation session before they go into VR. Maybe. And this brings me on to the next part of my talk. So group meditations using molecular simulations in virtual reality. So the previous part that I just spoke about was about discriminative interaction. How do we discriminate the properties of molecules? And now I'm going to be talking about affective interaction. What is the affective component of interacting with molecules in VR? Which is a slightly more strange abstract question. And I'm going to be doing this. Oh, that's bright. Um, I'm going to be doing this in the context of a study that we published last year, which is group VR experiences can produce ego attenuation and connectedness comparable to psychedelics. So I don't have time in this talk to go through all of the, the go through this entire study, but please do go and read it if you're interested. It's open access, anyone can read it. And so to give a context, we designed a group VR meditation using our interactive molecular simulation program. And then we took measures from the clinical psychedelic literature, questionnaires that they were using in that research area, to measure things like social connectedness and ego disillusion. And then we gave these questionnaires to participants following our group VR meditation. And, we found, and then we compared the data to the clinical psychedelic studies. And what we found was our results were similar, uh, statistic statistically indistinguishable from um, participants' data from clinical psych psychedelic studies who had taken moderate to high doses of psychedelic compounds. So, um, so I'm not going to talk any more about the psychedelic stuff here, but I am going to talk a bit about the meditation and the sensory perception that people experience. So the meditation was called Isness Distributed or Isness D. And this is the kind of setup that we had. So we had four participants um, here and we had one facilitator from our team who led the meditation. And all of the, the five people in the virtual space joined from different physical locations. And that's why it's called distributed because distributed VR is when people join the same virtual space from separate physical locations. And so here underneath, we have a representation of what the virtual space looks like. And all of the participants' uh, physical spaces were overlaid in this mandala, these straight lines here. And inside each rep participant, each person is represented as this cloud body. And here, this circle is the molecular simulation. And so what's really important to, to understand is this, this is the exact same VR program that I've been talking about that our, that our research group um, has created. The only difference is the way that we represent the molecule and the people in the space. So it's still a, a scientifically rigorous molecular simulation. It's being run on the cloud in real time and people can interact with it. And people do so with these gloves made by Rachel Frere here in my group. And with these gloves, you can actually, these replace the, the regular VR controllers that you get with a, where you usually press a trigger. Instead, you can interact with the molecular simulation using pinch. 
And so all of the participants are wearing these gloves during the, the meditation. So I have a screen recording here taken from inside the virtual space. And I'm just going to explain a little bit before we start. So this network that you see here with the nodes and the edges, that's the, the protein, the molecular simulation. And here is a 2D projection of that molecule on the floor, the, the plane of the floor. So that gives you a kind of perspective of where we're looking. We're looking down into the virtual space. And each of the participants were represented by a large light at the center of the chest. And these brighter lights that turn on and off as each participant pinches and unpinches. So that represents your interaction with the molecule. And it's at the pinch point of each of the person's hands. So let's see if we can play. So you can start to see the participants cloud bodies coming in and you can see the shapes of people in there. So this is slightly later on. Now the molecular simulation is really hard to distinguish from the participants and it's actually you can see it wiggling around here. This is even later on. So the participants now have red bodies and you can really see the hands. This person's doing this with the hand because there's a trail. And the molecular simulation is really faint. It's in here, but it's kind of all mixed in with them. And so part of the um, design of this, the aesthetic design of the space, was about facilitating overlap between participants and between participants with the with the molecule. So because nothing has solid boundaries, everyone can walk through each other. There's no, they're all in different physical locations so they can exist in the same virtual space. And this is interesting because this is not possible in the physical world. We can't overlap in the same physical space. And so it brings up the question of what does it feel like to interact uh, how, how does it feel to, to overlap with other people? And how does it feel to overlap with this molecular organism? And um, so here are some quotes that we have from participants referencing the sort of sensory experience that they had during this meditation. I feel like we've had a hug. I haven't had many of those recently. A really nice thing to have. One participant was struck with how quickly the abstract lights grew to hold tangible meaning as other people. It was especially poignant during moments of coalescence when we moved toward the center and felt as if we might collide or enter each other's personal space. I could feel subtle changes in my hands as if something was passing by, something physical. You can sense an imaginary presence around the glowing light and you give it space even though there is no barrier there other than imagined. We could get closer than in real life, which felt more intimate and connecting, nearly as much so as with a partner, child or pet, even though we were in different places. I can just literally walk pe into people and it's quite sensuous. So these kind of comments are really interesting because they're about something that we can't do in the physical world, but there is a, and there's clearly an affective component to interacting in this virtual space. And so this brings me to the end of my talk. And just I just want to leave, leave you guys with two, well, a take home message from this talk and from my research, which is rather than thinking of VR as lacking in physical touch, we can focus on its potential for offering new, powerful kinds of interaction. And interaction that is otherwise not possible because there is no physical world reference such as interacting with molecular simulations and overlapping with others through coalescence. Thanks for listening.
Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing with us your work. It's very interesting and uh, I think that the, there are questions here. We can share the microphone because uh, they need to. Thank you for the talk. Uh, well, from from the very beginning, I, I suppose that uh, this is some kind of intermediate state, uh, intermediate uh, research, which is supposed to have some downstream use mm -hmm. and i initially believed that this downstream use uh, should be somehow related to chemistry etc et but suddenly <laughs> i realized that we have the trans sudden transition to some meditation mm -hmm. i to be honest i <laughs> i initially believed that i miss maybe there is a second meaning of the word meditation but uh, now, uh, in the end, I understood that it is a meditation. I, I believe that it is. Mm -hmm. So did I get it right? You start from molecules and finish with meditation. Mm -hmm. Is it right? Yeah. But uh, for me, it looks like overcomplication of the final task, no? You, you, you uh, well, the final task is to create some interesting psychological experience for a group of people is that right well generally speaking exploring the sensory perception of virtual but, reality but isn't it too over over complicated maybe it, it could have been could it was starting from something much more much simpler than molecules molecules it's like you should be like chemistry master or i don't know and so, uh, well, yeah, the, my, my question is you start from something from so totally different sphere, which is pretty complicated and you finish with something else, which looks like having much easier solutions. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Did you get my question generally? <laughs> I don't think I understand. Are you asking why do we use molecular simulations for yeah. meditation? Is yeah. that part of it? Yeah. Why? Why the? Why is the, the starting point of this particular fi final task is mo molecule, mo molecular systems, or uh, whatever we we name them? So, you are you asking about the motivation of the last bit of research? Why? Mm -hmm. They don't use it just for the meditation. It yes. Ah, yes. Yeah. So yes. If 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 you have other uh, applic downstream application, this changes everything. Yes. Yeah. So people use our molecular simulation program for things like uh, looking into drug binding of proteins. So looking at how effectively a drug can bind to a protein. And one of my old colleagues was looking at this for the COVID protein. So she was looking at how how certain drugs dock to that protein in virtual reality. Uh, so, so this uh, kind of per, per, uh, physical perception can also help in other chemistry-related re downstream tasks, yes. right? Not only in this uh, uh, unusual virtual reality meditation. This yes. is just just one example of applications, right? Yes, but I think the point of the combination of both the artistic and the scientific is that we can't separate them out, even though we think that science is separated, maybe from artist artistry but it's not and especially when it comes to molecules because we have to interpret the way that they behave we have to interpret the way that they look so we have to use artistic creative representations and so if we can integrate art and science i think it better informs our science no, well okay okay thank you it's clear so comments or yeah. Ross, thank you so much. It was a nice talk, actually. And uh, I think that you found the way to show, well, not only to show that is invisible, but also to touch what is invisible. Um, I'm just thinking, is there any connection to some medical proposals? For example, maybe if you can touch in the virtual reality just only molecules, then you can touch also some, I don't know, organs from the human body, like heart or something. Um, have you thought about some kind of medical application of your research? Yeah, I think so. Virtual reality is being used for medical applications. So people you tend to use haptic technology. So providing physical feedback because 
the thing with medical applications is that there is a physical world reference. So we know what it's like to cut human tissue or to, to perform a surgery. So it probably is better to use haptic technologies that are currently being used. And so I think the power of this, this kind of um, lack, the, the alternatives to physical touch is really powerful when we're talking about things that can't be done in the physical world. And so we have, um, my supervisor is currently working on some projects looking at um, decreasing end of life anxiety with with things like this and connecting people across distances. So I think rather than the like surgical procedures, it would be better for the the socially connecting procedures, the the people to people connection. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. That was super interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments? Don't be shy. Any curiosity? Any any comment? Well, while they are thinking new questions, I'm going to to share with you uh, some questions. Um, it's a very, very interesting project from the beginning. I have read the scientific report that you have shared with us. Um, and it's very it's difficult to understand the framework of the work because it's related to many different things, very well connected. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, difficult to to understand the real dimension of the work uh, and to position your work in this uh, framework because you have talked first of all about molecular simulation. Uh, I don't know if you have uh, from the computer perspective, I don't know uh, the workload of these simulations if the computationally, if you are involved in the computationally work in the computational work of the simulations or if you I have read in the in the paper that you use uh, a GPU optimized uh, molecular simulation uh, yes uh, yeah environment. So I, I mean Jonathan's probably the best to answer this we there is a computational demand of course definitely with these simulations and we can't um, we can still only simulate in real time very small proteins or even just parts of proteins. And this is with quite a high level of, uh, well, it's with classical mechanics rather than even going into quantum mechanics. So there is a computational demand and my colleagues have done a lot to optimize that. So you are you, you are not working at this moment in this part? No. Yeah, mm, well, because mm. it's, it's very closely related to, to your work, but your work is on the artistic part on the statistics part, I'm not sure because uh, all the part related to meditation is very um, heavy from the statistical point of view. Yes. So I was I did the analysis for that paper. So I was it's more like the HCI computer uh, like psychology perspective of it. Even though my background is in chemistry, but I was on the uh, analyzing it, the data analysis. Yeah. Well because it's it's interesting to to position your work uh, in in this in this framework um i'm very interested on the potential of the of the virtual reality experiences for for group meditation because i have read something about uh, about the potential of um uh, these psychedelic drugs and meditation for for solving problems like uh, addiction or depression or these uh, yeah. um Panic to death, that uh, is a common problem in, in adults. So um, uh, reading, reading your work, I, I had some um, questions related. To, first of all, um, if you are um, establishing um, new um, perspectives from the scientific point of view, you need uh, good data. So you need to have experiences with, with many persons. I have read that you have a questionnaire, uh, a questionnaire with uh, 30 questions for all the participants in these experiences. Mm, but uh, the questions are related to um, mystical, um, mystical experiences. Yeah, mystical experiences and are very subjective. Yeah. So what's the correct way to select participants? Because they they 
they need to be capable of of answering questions that are not uh, are mm. not very easy for most of people. Uh, you have to be familiar with some uh, terms and with uh, some way of of expressing yourself. Definitely. You are asked about mysticity or um, self awareness or um, uh, overlapping. Yeah, 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 definitely. How and do you manage this this way of of uh, conducting the experiments? Yeah, well, so the orbits of this literature. So it's a very new area and we're not obviously if you're if you're a participant of a clinical psychedelic study, there's a lot of screening that you go through and you you want to do this. So there's uh certain participants are going for it. Whereas for us it's different and it's something it's definitely something for us to think about and I think a lot of the wording in these questionnaires might put off people who are more uh I know skeptical maybe and it's definitely it's definitely something that we have to think about I mean did you have a comment you were nodding a lot there till so, so, <laughs> uh, uh, so my background is in cognitive science that's where I'm joining from and I wrote my my bachelor thesis on uh, immersive cyberdelics, like what is out there in terms of uh, immersive technology, mostly virtual reality um, and altered states more broadly, not just the mystical experience, because there has been work conducted mostly in the art space, but also some research um, for a lot of years. It's too complicated to go into right now, but the main thing I was nodding about is that one of the core components of a mystical experience is a, something called ineffability, which is mm -hmm. just meaning you cannot describe your experience. So that's if you have that in a questionnaire, you try to ask people, how bad are you at describing your experience? That's already a really weird thing to to try and put it on a piece of paper. So it's just in the whole area of psychedelics, mystical experiences, it's always a question how to deal with that. Um, my bachelor supervisor is an expert in all the different questionnaires that are out there. He has a, um, there's a database. That's also what you used in the in the paper. Um, the uh, altered states database, where he tries, yeah, yeah, where he basically tries to collect all the research that has been done with psychedelic drugs, but also meditation or whatever else is out there that has used those uh, questionnaires, and where you can plot them against each other and see how those questionnaire scores add up between different sorts of experiences. And he's coming by the lab soon, in like two weeks or something. So we're going to talk with him and figure out more detailed how can we go about this? How do we make sure that the questionnaires we use actually measure what we want to measure? And ideally, we want to also add neuro, uh, neuroscience to it. And uh, he, that's part of his work is he's trying to pinpoint consciousness in the brain by using questionnaires and neuroscience and see the overlap between what do people report on the phenomenological side and what people report, what can we see in the brain at the same time and then try to create a mapping. So that's that's the approach we're taking, but it's early steps and it's really we're working towards it. Proof of yeah. concept stuff at the moment. Um, but the, the, the potential is, uh, it's, very, it's very interesting because uh, this have a uh, uh, high potential. I remember I have read about in the 60s when when the the, the first missions of, of Apollo um, were in the space, uh, they saw this blue marble is uh, the the earth as a blue marble, blue mar marble in, in against a dark uh, mm -hmm. infinite. And this changed the way I have read a, a book from Bill Clinton that oh. was very was very interested in in this experience and he changed the way of making politics based on this experience of being part of the universe so it, it can some persons are exec, skeptical about this this kind of of interaction but i think that scientifically uh, this has sense yeah uh, to 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 be deeper in this in these interactions but as as i understood your only feedback when you participate in one of these experiences is uh, the vision and your feelings regarding the vision. You don't have any feedback from your... Um, no. Any kind of additional feedback because this could be more powerful if you had any kind of feedback different from this one. There's audio. audio. There's audio. Yeah. And I think... The thing you're not getting physical feedback 
but you are you still have your awareness of proprioception yeah so you still have an awareness of how you're interacting with that virtual space and causing an effect on it and that can lead to these kind of perceptions i mean we think that's how people can sense these properties of molecules and i think haptic feedback providing that physical feedback like you say is really interesting and i think the question is how do we work them together because haptic feedback has a tendency to kind of take over everything and people will just focus on that and forget to feel the more subtle sensations that they're discussing here i it's, understand yeah so it's how do you work together with that more subtle aspect of interaction because the next the next question is that that I, I have a question. What's the difference with, for example, um, an interactive game, um, any any of the of the games, uh, internet uh, sharing the experience with more people? Because being part of something, being uh, at home alone, mm. um, is a kind of mystic experience. Uh, sharing something, mm. not physically. Um, how how can you def defend this this um, um, this two uh, in contrast with a simple experience of playing together on like a computer screen? Yeah, yeah. The computer screen. I think that's the power of the sensations that you experience in that space. You have a body, you have a that's a sort of connected to your physical body. There's a different or being yourself there. Yeah, but I think that there is a very powerful connection that people. Um, form across these these digital spaces whether you're immersed in that vr experience or whether it's immersion in the game a 2d computer game i think you could form really powerful connection with others definitely that's a really important aspect of people's lives especially now we spend so much time on the computer yeah we spend we had the pandemic people couldn't actually physically see each other so i think they're really important for us and and also for persons who have problems for uh, for the interaction for the physical interaction yeah. any kind of problems yeah uh, psychological or physical uh, exactly it allows you to sort of create your own boundaries yeah. where you you're comfortable with those boundaries yeah. in the in the physical world is more difficult yeah definitely it's very 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 interesting thank you very very nice presentation and very interesting work so Taking on what Dora was saying, I, I'm thinking, of, for example, physically impaired people who cannot maybe walk, and yeah, uh, you know, uh, get involved in these experiences. This, this for for these people can be blow minding, uh, I guess. And so, um, I take that you are not planning to sort of find some correlation between these uh, sensorial experiences and measuring at the same time some physical parameters like blood pressure or you know temperature it would be a very interesting thing to do i mean we're sort of talking about it as a group yeah. uh yes yeah yeah but we've yet to start actually the equipment is actually it's really difficult to measure these yeah, things whilst indeed, people indeed. are moving yeah in, and it in requires licenses and lots of uh, i guess approvals and so on but i mean it would be experienced to see how these um, changes in physical parameters correlate with the experiences that people are reporting Definitely. from a more subjective point of view. Definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very nice work. <laughs> we have any any question or thank you. Um, okay, now my question was about like the molecular simulation part. When you say like you touch a molecule or an atom, you feel something, but you feel like you talk about uh, rigidity or elasticity, so you feel only the mechanical like properties of the uh, molecule or atom. Uh, yes, inside. in the first part, yeah. Okay. Depend I think it kind of depends on how you represent the molecule, but if it's a regular ball and stick, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> we could try it out later. So. It's connected to, to this question. So you are simulating the molecule with classical mechanics, so balls and sticks mm -hmm. or springs and springs. And and I can imagine that the sensation, the perception of touch uh, highly depends on this kind of simulation. And is I, I imagine I'm not a chemist, but I imagine that there are other ways of representing molecules. Um, so, um, for example, you mentioned uh, the quantum mechanics uh, approaches. Um, 
do you think it's a computational problem for now that we don't have computer fast enough or that intrinsically it's difficult to represent a quantum molecule because it doesn't have boundaries and uh, uh, so we actually do have an interactive quantum simulation so you can do it but for way fewer atoms um okay. but we still represent them as balls and sticks so it's kind of like you can feel it and it but it's kind of similar to the classical mechanical yeah so my follow up question was the touch sensation is it similar depending on the two models that you use or do you uh, as a as a practitioner like in colloquial terms do you feel a difference without the pilot study or is it similar it does feel different because for example uh using our uh, classical mechanics you can't simulate bond breaking whereas quantum mechanics you can ah. so you can feel the bond breaking in a way that you can't feel here so there is so I you think there break is, the molecule you yeah mean. exactly you can break those edges and pull apart the nodes um so yeah i would say it does feel different but i think the representation because we're using exactly the same representation the ball and stick i think it that we kind of put our perception of what a ball and stick would do in the physical world onto that which is why we use balls and sticks because you kind of have an intuitive sense of what that means and so i think that is having a huge effect but how do you represent something that doesn't that exists in all of space it's like uh, yeah it's uh, uh, that's an interesting <laughs> challenge of perception yeah oh uh, well, thank you thank you and what what are the next steps in your work in your phd work in all these yeah well i really we want to get this study done with measuring quantifying that perception for specific molecules and then i think i'm really interested in looking at different representations of molecules because we're so used to using these representations we've had for decades and exploring new ways of representing it like we sh we saw in the, the meditation changing it how does that change our perception and how can we quantify that yeah well if if you don't have more questions we can finish here thank you very much for for your presentation and for your thank you uh, dialogue uh, now and and good luck with your work thank you and thank, thank you. you everyone <laughs> thank you for attending